Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this uh, session on virtual patient cohorts, breaking the data deadlock. And uh, I will be uh, the moderator for this uh, session. And uh, my name is Elisabetta Vaudana, I'm the Principal Scientific Manager at the Innovative Medicine Initiative, which is the largest public private partnership in health, actually, in the world. And we support the collaborative research in, in health uh, coming from an infectious disease, like, for example, so COVID, of course, and uh, non-infection, uh, non-transmissible disease, like neurodegenerative disease, and in particular, Alzheimer. And it would be uh, my pleasure in uh, this uh, session to uh, introduce, uh, first of all, uh, to uh, three very uh, talented uh, spot-on um, speakers that uh, will uh, be uh, the one that will be really the protagonist of this uh, section. First of all, we will start with uh, Dr. Graciela Muniz Terrera. Uh, she's a senior lecturer in biostatistic epidemiology at the University of Edinburgh and in the Edinburgh Dementia Prevention Group. And uh, she's uh, also a young project associate professor at the University of Victoria in uh, Canada. And uh, she is originally from Uruguay, where she graduated and then uh, complete, completed a master in mathematics and mathematical statistics. But then she continued her study in Brazil and Mexico before uh, moving then to UK, where she uh, did a PhD in uh, biostatistics at the University of Cambridge. She has uh, uh, published extensively in the aging and dementia and developed a large network of international collaboration. And uh, she has really become a leader in statistics and epidemiology of dementia and dementia prevention. And she has a particular interest uh, in its international perspective and dementia prevention in low and uh, middle income countries. And uh, the, her work really uh, gives evidence of uh, her additional interest in harmonization methods and uh, for uh, important and reproducible uh, research. Her speech will be followed by the one of uh, Professor Martin Hoffman Apicius, we, who uh, started by uh, having a PhD in molecular biology, and she worked in the field for more than 10 years. But uh, then uh, he really uh, moved in different fields. For, he, moved, he was first in academia, then he moved to industry. But from 2002, he's leading the Department of Bioinformatics and the Frankhofer Institute for Algorithm and Scientific Computing in uh, St. Augustine in Germany. And he's also professor for Applied Life Science Informatics at Bonn Aachen International Center for Information Technology. Uh, Martin uh, has uh, written uh, more than 150 papers and has uh, done important scientific contribution on the cloning and identification of the CD44V gene uh, for uh, very important thing for metastatic in uh, tumor cells, for the functional annotation of the mouse transcriptome, and, and also for important technological and methodological um, uh, achievement for the information extraction and uh, to be used also for semi-automatic generation of uh, first comprehensive compatible model for Alzheimer's disease. Martin has been uh, uh, the academic initiator and coordinator of the IMI project at Sionomy and has also been involved in uh, other projects in IMI like APA, FAGO and the Radar AD. He will then be followed by Holger, Holger Frölich, that uh, it will be uh, the one that will uh, close the, the session as a, as a speaker. And uh, he is, um, has a PhD in computer science and uh, at position uh, in uh, the German Cancer Research Center and then a professorship at the University of Bonn. Then he uh, moved to, uh, to industry and became director of, uh, and head of an artificial intelligence and data science team uh, within uh, with uh, the global company UCB, but now has just uh, joined actually uh, Martin Institution, where he's a head of the Artificial Intelligence and Data Science Group and deputy head of the Department of Bioinformatics at the Frankhofer Sky. Uh, Martin uh, Holger's uh, focus of research is on the development of data science and, and artificial intelligence methods for application in precision medicine, early drug discovery, and system medicine. Uh, he has also published uh, extensively, 
and he's been working with several national and international consortia and uh, among these, uh, for example, again, Exionomy, we will talk about this, and the virtual brain uh, clouds. So, uh, but what is our section about is really uh, on, first of all, uh, virtual court. But what is a court? So a court, uh, just for uh, being all understood about this, is a group of people that is selected on the basis of certain characteristic of, or, for example, exposure to a specific risk factor, like can be cigarette score. And why is important to, uh, to have this court, to study this court, why in re research need them? It is because they are very powerful tools really to study how common diseases are, their cause, what happened them, what happened to the patient. And they are also extremely valuable for identifying individuals to enroll in a clinical trial and other treatment. And normally what is done when one study a cohort? In general, uh, what happens is that one compare in a cohort with a two or more group of, diverse, of people that have different characteristics, study, study them over time. For example, if the study is the effect of smoke on, on health, for example, on cancer, one could compare a cohort of smoker with a cohort of not smoker. And one can do this by collecting data de novo on this individually. Individual, this is so, is so called the prospective court. And for example, one can follow then a court of aged truck driver that have different smoking habits over time. Uh, for example, the heavy smoker, the moderate smoker, and the no smoker. But sometimes is it, this is not possible. And then is where it's important to have also retrospective courts, which are sort of uh, uh, courts where the data uh, are not collected, but they are already existing uh, from uh, exist existing records. And uh, um, one advantage of this is that they can be immediately used for, for analysis. And, uh, and uh, one has not to wait for the time of, uh, of collection, which can be extremely long and labor, as you will hear, for example, now, first of all, from Graciela. But uh, so if we can do uh, collect data in uh, real people, what is the problem there? Why then we will need something as uh, sort of uh, disruptive as a virtual court, virtual people? And uh, what are the advantages then of a virtual versus standard courts? And uh, OK, if we want to have a virtual court, how do we create it? And how is this now used nowadays already? And what could be done with such a court in the virtual court in the future? I hope that this section will uh, answer some of this uh, question. And uh, if you will have more questions, there will be a Q&A Q uh, session where you will be able to, to answer them. And uh, so for the moment, I'm stopping here. And now I will uh, give the floor to the first speaker, that is Graciela. Thanks, Elisabetta, for the introduction. Um, I'm pleased, honored to, to be presenting at this session. And the perspective I'd like to, to present today is a perspective of uh, data challenges and opportunities for dementia prevention. So we know that according to the World Health Organization, in September 2019, there were around 50 million people with dementia. But the numbers are increasing every year, with ne nearly 10 million new cases every year. Unfortunately, dementia has no cure yet. Right? So what we are trying to focus our efforts is on dementia prevention. And dementia prevention becomes absolutely essential. However, to fully understand dementia and to develop the necessary interventions to delay its onset and, and prevent the disease, we really need large amounts of good quality data. Now, as scientists, we know that science is a collaborative, collaborative activity, and it is common practice to share efforts and, um, and work together. That's the way forward in science. Now, I said that you know, 
there are, there are different factors that impact dementia research. And I was saying that one of those factors is data availability. And, and large data, uh, large good quality data sets are needed to answer the key questions of interest. For example, who are the individuals or what are the characteristics of the individuals who will have a higher risk of developing the condition? And it's, it's, you know, it's sort of, if you want, in, in the scientific community, it is common knowledge to say, well, genetic studies are the type of studies that require large data sets. But our point is that it's not just genetic studies, but other type of studies from disease modeling and epidemiology research also require large data sets. But unfortunately, collecting new data is not quick, is not easy, and is not uh, cheap. So from our perspective, from the researcher's perspective, the cost is a very important factor. Just as an example, um, informal citation is not, don't quote me on these numbers, but an informal citation is that in one of the studies I was involved, the cost per person, per visit, was about 3,500 pounds. Now, however, often when we are wanted, we're trying to understand dementia, we need to follow people and we have to collect data on biomarkers, behaviors, cognitive and phys physical function. But the study of these questions is uh, usually involved the study of their change. So we had to follow participants over time for a number of years. So time is also a critical factor and studies need to mature. We also have the other perspective. That was the researcher's perspective, but we also have this other perspective that is a participant's perspective. And some individuals see participants' participation in research as burdensome. There are huge efforts that have been um, made to engage participants in studies, and fantastic progress has been made in that regard. And one of the studies I would like to mention as an exemplary study where participants have been involved all the way is the European Prevention of Alzheimer's Dementia Study, say EPA, what IMI funded. And I'm, you know, participants were involved all the way, even uh, joining our general assemblies every year. So that was a fantastic opportunity, an example of participation. Unfortunately, some individuals still have concerns and are still reluctant to get involved in research. But there is also another aspect that you'd like to mention. Elisabetta mentioned that my interest in research in low and middle income countries. And those are, this is an aspect that I also want to mention as a, challenging, uh, as a challenge for advancing dementia research. Most research in dementia has been conducted in Western and wealthy societies. And some groups in, those, uh, in the studies that we have are unfortunately underrepresented. And that is the case of ethnic minorities, for instance. And also, despite large increases in dementia cases are actually happening in low and middle income countries, the data collection in these countries can be also hampered by the lack of resources, economic and human, and sometimes there are some cultural factors that also affect the collection of your data in those countries. So faced with the challenges of new data collections, scientists often joined efforts and considered using existing data. But when we go there, there are some other challenges that also emerge. For example, the identification of adequate data sets can be difficult. Sometimes research studies are easier to find than industry-funded studies. And, some, uh, and, and once the studies are identified, it's often, it often happens that an in-depth understanding of the actual data availability can be extremely time-consuming, as the data documentation, uh, the, the practices in data documentation vary and also depend on the settings. Some industry and research tend to use different um, ways and different, use different practices for data documentation. 
It also happens that the data sets can become dated because the technology or the instruments that we have used to collect the data change. So that can be also a difficulty. Um, and the data request procedures can be slow. Um, just as a personal experience, uh, in my case, it took me in one of the cases and one of the examples that I, uh, the cases that I tried to use data, uh, the data process re request took over a year. And in fact, it took a year and a half to get the data request approved. And of course, as scientists, we had to worry about the confidentiality and the non-identifiability of the study participants. And we had to you know, had devote enormous efforts to preserve them. And the institutions have their own processes in place to guarantee the preservation of confidentiality and non-identifiability. But the whole process can be painfully slow. And unfortunately, some institutions and all researchers can also be quite reluctant to share data. And in some cases, there's also the, even the requirement of the physical presence of the analyst in the building hosting the data. As, a, as you can imagine, that can be difficult. So in terms of the future, we, we acknowledge that enormous efforts and very positive advances in data initiatives have been made. We have fantastic data catalogs, and we have also some standardized practices in, towards the standardization of data documentation. But there are still some huge hurdles that slow down or hamper scientific developments in dementia research. And advances in data sciences, I think, are offering a way forward to overcome these challenges and also to disrupt these obsolete research practices. And as scientists, I believe that we have almost like an obligation to adapt these new practices. So clearly, uh, we are living in exciting times. So we have to be open-minded and work together in a trust, trusting and collaborative environment to embrace these new opportunities that um, the scientific advances in data sciences are bringing us. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone and uh, invite Martin to present next. Thank you. Okay, so now thank you to Graciela for her uh, important and uh, interesting introduction. And now we go to Martin. That's the title of his talk already today at all. Wonderful. Uh, thanks, uh, Graciela, and thanks, Elisabetta, for um, the intro. I hope you can see my screen. Um, the question is now, why do we need virtual cohorts? And the first answer is already given on that slide, because sometimes data are like ghost ships. So why um, do we worry about um, cohort data? Why we, do we worry about studies? Elisabeth already mentioned that we need this sort of uh, studies to find out what are the mechanisms of diseases, uh, how does disease progression work, um, how do we test safety and efficacy of new drugs and other interventions. This is all done in studies. Um, studies also give us uh, important insights on what biomarkers are, and biomarkers are in essence uh, measurables, so things that we can measure that give us a clue on the state we are in, the disease state or the healthy state or uh, at the border from healthy to disease. So we, to sum this up, we can say studies with patients 
are the cornerstones of any translational biomedical research. Now, studies are sometimes a bit like islands. And what you see here in this slide is um, a collection of islands uh, that are different in shape and the, the form is different. Um, they have, some of them are green, some of them are obviously without any uh, plants on them. They all share one thing, which is a, a runway, um, and it's actually the spread lace. But the analogy here is that uh, some of those uh, islands that I named, like Adneuromed and PPMI and Adne, we used actually in the autonomy project. And what you see with this island paradigm is that you cannot directly compare studies to each other. They are different uh, with respect to the recruitment protocols, to the time points of visits. If they are longitudinal, um, they may be smaller in size, they may be bigger ones. So uh, comparing different studies is non-trivial, but still they have some things in common, which allows us at least sometimes to use one cohort study as I'm sorry that we had some problem with uh, Martin and therefore uh, we will have him to come back a bit later when the technical problem is solved. So uh, now we will have to move to uh, Holger uh, with his presentation. So thank you very much, Holger, to jump in and uh, to, to start your presentation. Thank you very much. Manage to get Martin back, so Holger has to wait a little bit, but I think it's good because Martin actually will give an important introduction to what would help for all their presentation. So please, Martin, we yeah. have more a problem now. My
Okay, my apologies for the network fa failure. Um, so we, we were with the ghost ships. Um, I, I just told you that the, um, the studies we are dealing with are sometimes like ghost ships in, 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 in those pirate mu movies. Um, and they appear, they appear briefly uh, and when you write a grant proposal and then they disappear when you want to work with them. Um, and that is, sounds funny, but it is not funny at all um, because there are some studies uh, and they are heavily funded and with public money, but they are not, it's not able to uh, validate findings made in these studies in independent cohorts. In fact, a lot of, and actually the majority still of, of um, clinical studies that we are interested in, in particular in the field of neurodegenerative diseases, Elisabetta uh, Vaudano mentioned that in the intro, that we are specialized on the neurodegenerative disease area. Um, a lot of those studies are still heavily siloed. They are not interoperable. They don't have shared metadata with other, um, with other uh, data sets. They are not really interoperable. They cannot be easily used for um, mathematical type of analysis, modeling and, uh, and mining approaches. Sometimes they do also have their very specific problems with missing data, for instance, they are incomplete. Actually, most of the longitudinal studies that run over time are notoriously incomplete. So, and even then, when you have access to a study, sometimes this doesn't mean that you can really work with it um, because uh, when, for instance, inside of a working consortium, a group of people in Europe that works together, uh, you try to work in a collaborative fashion on a data set. Um, each of the individual partners needs its own, his or her own copy. Um, that, that is something we came across in the Economy project. Sometimes important parts of the data set are not in the package that is, has been shared with you. Um, and, uh, and sometimes you really have to to chase the people who have produced the data to really hand over or to share with you uh, the most recent and most complete data set. Um, and then data always notoriously are incomplete uh, of limited quality very often um, and they are very often also not directly comparable to other studies. Finally, there is this big issue of data privacy. And data protection has a good side, um, of course, because we all don't want that any other people can mess around with our private data. On the other side, um, it's pretty clear that data privacy uh, legislation is also a sort of roadblock. So uh, the GDPR, the Declaration of the Human Rights and so on are all regulations that apply for the use of patient level data as we call them, so patient specific data. And very often um, we cannot do what we would like to do. We cannot drive forward translational biomedical research to the extent as we would like to do it because of uh, data protection regulation. Now I'm not in saying here that data protection is bad and, and free data is good. Of course, we all have to work in a very uh, um, conscious way with patient level data, even though they may be anonymized. But in fact, the data protection makes it easy for data owners not to share. And there is a sociological effect with not sharing, because if you sit on a nice clinical study and a nice set of data, then you can publish and you're the only one in the world who can publish on that data set. Uh, on the expense that nobody externally can validate your findings. So our way, and that was an insight from the autonomy project, our way to overcome the challenges that I just outlined was to introduce synthetic data. Synthetic data as a way to respect on one side the data privacy, and at the same time to enable translational research. Um, and the background, of that is, you know, in the modern times of AI, and Holger will talk about that in more detail, AI and data science, um, we, we need to play with data. And typically we grew up and 
people and our parents told us you must not play with money, you must not play with food. And uh, some people say you must not play with patient data. But in fact, actually, we have to play with data. Uh, data scientists do that extensively. They test things. They cannot always say why, you know, they what what their what their working hypothesis is. They just play with data, and and uh, that's that's a, a prerequisite actually for a lot of developments in the AI field. So for methods development, for clinical trial simulation, for mechanism-based identification of patient subgroups, for instance, for all what you know as deep learning, we need to play with data. And actually when we teach and when we, when we grow the next generation of data scientists and biomedical researchers, we need students to play with data too. And that's why we created toy data, so to speak, to play with. And these are the virtual cohorts. They are essentially synthetic data sets. They are instructed, so primed or, or determined by the reality, by the observation, but they don't interfere with patient data privacy rights because artificial patients have no privacy rights. They are nonetheless very close to the reality because we instructed them, we, we modeled them according to what we observe in the reality. They actually would allow to publish clinical data and nobody can hide behind the data protection argument anymore. We could share at global scale clinical data. We can generate something like global meta cohort. So essentially glue the islands that I've shown you together to form a big island. We can even integrate a priori knowledge. So things about that we know about how disease starts, what are disease mechanisms. We could uh, do things like merging data sets that you can never merge in the reality, even unethical stuff that you, that you merge data sets of entire families, um, parents, children, and, and whatsoever. You can do all this mix and merge type of games. The way how Holger and the data scientists in our uh, collaborations, and that also extends to Graciela and the team in Edinburgh, how they do that is you take data from existing studies, you learn a model uh, uh, of the data, you use that model in a generative fashion as a generator of new data, and that leads to the simulation of virtual subject from the model that has been taught initially by reality. And this is just an example here, what I show you here. This is a, a, a combination of actually um, variables, so features of real existing Alzheimer's disease patients and synthetic ones. And we have mixed them and you can't really tell them from each other because they simply cannot be distinguished. That's something that Holger can show at a statistically sound level and he may talk about that. I just show you here in this pattern, in this visual plot, uh, that you cannot distinguish real-world Alzheimer patients from synthetic uh, virtual patients. And with that, I'm done. And I thank you for the attention. I apologize again for the uh, interrupt in between. And uh, with that, I would then hand over to Holger. So thank you, Martin. It was great to hear to all your presentation. And I think now Holger has a good background for his uh, presentation will be the final one of this session. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk here. So I will, um, first of all, shed a little bit more clarity on how we actually generate synthetic or virtual cohorts after you have heard previously why we should do that. So in essence, what we do is we um, use a real existing cohort sitting, for example, within a university medical center 
And then based on these real data, we train algorithms, artificial intelligence algorithms. And these algorithms actually find patterns in the original data. And they um, yield a mathematical representation of these patterns that are there in the real patient cohorts. And via these mathematical representations and these rules that the artificial intelligence algorithm has learned, it is then possible to actually generate a lot of synthetic um, data, a lot of synthetic patients. So each of these synthetic patients is not identical. So they might be very different, very individual in fact, and you can generate as many as you want from them. So for example, what we have done in the past is to generate a million Alzheimer's patients in that way. And that can be done very, very quickly after this mathematical representation has been generated. So it's actually a matter of minutes afterwards. So, and I should add so that we have done this and pioneered this even in the um, IMI project Etionomy, so which was a collaborative project uh, between pharma industry and uh, academia. And there's also quite a number of publications now on the methods also that we have uh, developed for that purpose around now. So now once we have such a synthetic data, such a synthetic cohort, there's of course a very important question that pops up. So namely, how much can we actually trust those patients? So is this some data that we can really use for something? And for answering this question, what we do is we make a rigorous comparison, in fact, against the real patient cohort. So, and what we do with that is that we, in fact, generate a rigorous quality report. So we do a lot of statistical measures that look for, for different variables and distributions, and we do certain um, measures on that and reports. And at the end of the day, we can even um, say something about how realistic an individual subject might be compared to the real uh, data cohort. And based off, of, out of that, then you can think about this really as a kind of traffic-like system in which we can say, okay, these patients and these patient cohort is more or less realistic compared to what you see in the real world. So, now the thing is, okay, if we have now a synthetic patient cohort that is, is very realistic, there's now some people and data privacy officers specifically that might say, okay, yeah, but what if now these synthetic patients are in some sense too realistic? So what if by whatever chance in the, from these synthetic cohorts, I would be able to re-identify a real patient? So this is a real concern. So it's, it's, it is really something that pops up in discussions with uh, data privacy officers. However, there's also a solution to that which we have implemented. And that is that you can train in essence these AI algorithms under very specific restrictions and constraints, so-called differential privacy. And these co constraints actually allow you to provide guarantees mathematically provable guarantees on the risk of re-identifying any real patients from the synthetic cohort. So now we have heard so that there's indeed um, different ways how we can assess the quality of synthetic patients. We can um, reassure that they are not, uh, re that we cannot re-identify real patients from that. So let's recapture what we can now do with the help of synthetic patient data. So from my point of view, there are three main value areas. So on one hand, and this is, was more the point that uh, Graziela made at the beginning, there is science itself. So we can use these data to help researchers understand data that they cannot directly access, or we can enlarge underrepresented patient groups. So for example, ethnic minorities, so that otherwise in the data might be only very infrequent and by a, a conventional statistical methods, we might not be able to extract any meaningful pattern for them. But if we enlarge these underrepresented group with the help of these technologies, we may be able to something. Or if you think about the current COVID situation where we have comparably few patients in Germany, at least in individual hospitals, 
it is really a challenge to train machine learning models that would predict a outcome for these patients. And with the help of synthetic data, however, we can enlarge these number of patients artificially can train AI models on them. And then accordingly, this allows us to also answer important medical question for this underrepresented in quotation mark group of people. So this is more the science perspective, but there's also the more industry perspective, the perspective from pharma industry is on clinical trials. So they want, of course, to make their clinical studies as cheap as possible, that's clear. So now one of the important factors when you design a clinical study is that you have to decide on which people actually do you want to take into the study. So these are the so-called inclusion exclusion criteria. And indeed saying, so I want to include people that are 60 or 70 or 80 or so, and it makes a difference or could make a difference. So if we were able now with synthetic data to simulate, and this is possible in fact, so-called what if scenarios. So what if people are 10 years older, younger? So what if they are less uh, disease, uh, have less higher or uh, lower disease severity, such things. So then you can actually optimize these inclusion and exclusion criteria for a trial. Or you can even merge um, the different control arms that exist in clinical studies from the same disease area throughout the world counterfactually. So you can bring these data synthetically together. And that of course would um, have a huge cost impact because um, also recruiting patients for these, for, for which are never treated with a real drug, which are just uh, served there for a control in order to test the drug again. So this, of course, also costs a lot of money. Finally, of course, there's an impact on clinical routine. So imagine so that I'm a physician and I have in front of me sitting a patient uh, 60 years old with diabetes. So I might be interested in knowing, so how might these patients develop in the future? So I can look now in synthetic data and, and can filter in essence these synthetic patient trajectories. So these are real clinical trajectories with a certain time dimensions to patients, synthetic patients that have the same characteristics, 60 years old and having diabetes. And I can understand how these patients might, uh, these, the, the, the real patients then might develop accordingly. So it leads in essence to a better individualized patient treatment. So of course, there's in science, nothing without limits. So we are, we are not magic, we are doing science and science has always limits. And one of the limits is of course, that we use AI methods in order to generate these synthetic data. So these models, these, these, these algorithms learn from real data. And in essence, that means we need sufficiently large numbers of um, real data at first place. Furthermore, of course, these synthetic data cannot generate something that you have never seen in real data. So for example, if your real data from which the AI algorithm tries to infer patterns only contains people with blue eye color, so then you're not able to generate afterwards people with brown eye in color. Or if you wanted to simulate the clinical response to a drug treatment, which has never ever been tested anywhere, you would also not be possible, it would also not be possible with such an approach. So in summary, in essence, we have at hand very um, useful and modern AI methods that we have um, particularly also developed in, in my team that allow us for simulating realistic synthetic patients. And these have a time dimension they can be simulated such that they respect data privacy of, of real patients they can be really controlled for their quality. And we can do this for many types of data, in fact. So we can do this for clinical studies. So that was here some of the example, but we can do this for many other types of data as well that are useful in medicine. And the value is really threefold. So it's for science, it's for the sake of making clinical trials easier and cheaper. And it's also um, to help clinical routine. Okay, so what's next? So now we have something great at hand. So what's next now? I think we need to translate the approach into industrial applications. But this of course requires to build trust at first place. For this purpose, we need demonstrator projects. 
And I just want to mention here one, so in which we are at the moment part of, so this is NFDI for Health in Germany, for example, which focuses on uh, university medical centers and tries to um, bring there the data together. And specifically in this context, we will also uh, bring in a component that allows us to simulate synthetic data for data sharing purposes. But I think another important component is really public-private partnerships in order to onboard also industry. And Eternomy here um, is really a very positive example for this in this context. And in this context, of course, we need to include uh, data privacy officers, of course, and lawyers from different organizations. And we, can, we should, of course, do this in Europe, maybe, uh, but also in the future, um, also beyond, maybe worldwide. With that, I would like to thank you. And this is uh, the list of people that uh, really contributed to this work. And uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much to all the speakers. And uh, now we uh, would like to uh, start the question and answer uh, uh, session. So uh, the regie has told me that I should be able to see a uh, question coming now. Uh, so please, uh, uh, if you have a question for the speakers, now is uh, your time to be able to, to ask them. And uh, while uh, I hope that uh, some question will start to pop in on the on the screen, maybe I can uh, I can start to to ask uh, some uh, some question. So uh, first of all, um, I think that uh, one word that we heard, and I think we heard it from uh, all the speaker, uh, but I think. Um, um, Martin also used it, is uh, uh, the word of trust. And uh, why we need trust? What do we mean trust? Who should trust who? Maybe Martin, you would like to uh, answer or something? Yeah, I, can, I, I, can, I can give my perspective or share my perspective on, on uh, trust. Trust is a, a, a big um, topic in um, uh, in, in the entire, you know, in, in, in computing, in, in computer science uh, in general, um, we, we trust all, you know, hardware uh, producers like Apple and so on that they, uh, you know, we, we don't even know really what, what type of data they all harvest over the entire day. And we trust the app developers uh, that their apps don't phone home or so. Uh, we trust when we use a banking app and we um, we trust that the Google Maps or so is accurate and doesn't lead us into uh, the, the Grand Canyon or so. Um, so so whenever we interact with computer systems, we um, we actually demonstrate a incredible uh, degree of trust uh, in, you know, I, I had some trust in the internet connection a couple of minutes ago and, and I was fooled. Uh, but but uh, the the point here in the medical sector is that this is of course very sensitive. Uh, on on the other side, I see a discrepancy and imbalance between the fear dominated discussion in in uh, in medicine and in medical informatics and the trust or the naive sometimes naive uh, uh, discussion we have uh, in all other you know when people share half of their life on Facebook. So there is there's certainly a discrepancy. I think um, for the virtual cohorts, we in the context of the virtual cohorts, we may even have a system now at hand that can give people a value for trust or trust trustworthiness. So Holger mentioned that briefly that there is there is methodology that allows to compute actually the the level of trust that you can have to a, uh, um, uh, a virtual cohort by means of non-re-identifiability of uh, individuals in the real world. So 
I think um, trust comes with with trust comes actually with with using stuff with getting used to it. We we don't trust if it's completely new, and it will take some time until uh, virtual cohorts are being trusted. Um, uh, also, with respect to the outcome of in silico experimentation of, of, of mining approaches. Uh, Holger mentioned a couple of them, like a trial simulation or so that we could do, um, or, or a, um, a comparison of the individual person in front of a doctor to all the other persons with the same diagnosis, uh, the patients like me scenario. Um, there, there will be some time needed until people trust in that. And until we have a feeling for the reliability of this new tool. But it's coming, I can say. Um, they, when, you, when you go to the Dementia Platform UK, for instance, you find the first synthetic data set. So they have a corner just for synthetic data now. So in our domain, in the neurodegenerative disease research community, the, the, the virtual cohorts, the synthetic data sets are already underway and, and, and being, being now you know, offered and will be used more and more. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, so I'm still waiting for uh, some questions from the audience, but... Uh, can, can I bring, Elisabetta, another perspective yes. into the word trust? Yes, please. So uh, Julio was saying also that, you know, virtual cohorts are, are well, obviously are very important. We, we, we are very uh, hopeful about all the advances that, that they can bring in, but they also need real data so you know the, the, the virtual cohorts can be can you they need to use real data and there's another aspect of trust that also involves the patient or the participant scientist trust link that that we are working very hard to develop right? and and also from the participant participants perspective and from the scientist perspective the work is on is the, the responsibility of developing that trust comes from, I feel that it comes from the scientists towards the participant. So being open about what we do and how we use the data is another aspect of trust that, you know, we, we are making huge advances, but it's another aspect of trust that, that we still have to keep working hard on. Yeah, so I mean, if I may also say something in addition, so I would say there are in general different dimensions of trust, right? So there is more a technical perspective or scientific perspective, which more comes along how trustworthy is basically an individual synthetic patient or patient cohort. So um, are my findings that I am doing with such synthetic data anything useful or so, right? So, uh, I mean, imagine so that at some point we might even be possible to publish something purely from synthetic data. I think this is, a, we are not there yet, right? So, but you, you can, if you, if you think about this same scenario, right? So to, to accept something like that, you really need to do a quite large step in, in, in trust, yeah? And then on the other hand, there's this um, data privacy aspect that Martin pointed out, right? So in how far can, uh, for example, patients and, and data privacy officers trust that synthetic data does not breach any sort of, of privacy, right? Of, of, and, and does not re-identify by any chance anything real, right? So any real patient. And then I think last but not least, there is uh, this more social component, right? So if I talk to people in, in different organizations and in industry and so on, and I tell them, okay, maybe they find this is an interesting idea, yeah? But if they really want to turn use that, if they really want to jump onto that, right? So they would usually say, yeah, I mean, sounds interesting. Yeah, maybe it works, but we want to, you know, we want to first see some results. We want to first see how this really works in a couple of projects, etc. right? So this is more the relationship building that comes along with that. So it's in essence, a social aspect. Yeah? Yes. So, but, uh, so just, uh, just to continue maybe on, uh, on also on, on this, I mean, we, we, you said also that uh, when and to, to say that the virtual court can be trusted, that you sort of have to compare and see also that the same behave like a real court. 
But also we know that uh, when the signs happen is not normally when the unexpected happen. So if we are in the context of a virtual cohort, how can you then distinguish if something unexpected is happening because it's really, now we have the leap that would give really progress or instead it's because the algorithm is gone banana. Exactly. So I think this is exactly the point, right? So in order to find, if you say I find a certain pattern in these synthetic data and I really want to publish this as something, you know, interesting, scientifically interesting, I would have to have the trust that it's not just an artifact by the, by the algorithm, right? So this is, so I just took this as an example, right? So that in order to come to maybe at some point to such a situation, there's really a, a, a trust needed at this technical level. How much do we can really trust this synthetic data plus maybe also a certain, yeah, this, this more social aspect, right? So also for the scientific community to get uh, used with working with such type of data more and more, right? So getting experience, understanding the limits, right? So in, in, in reality, all of that, right? So this is a process. It's nothing that you can say, yeah, I mean, I have this and there's measures and now go with it, right? So it comes along with time. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I don't know, so Graciela, maybe if you have some perspective also to, to having to work with, uh, with uh, let's say, um, standard or real patient data, maybe is also a question to create a good uh, collaboration between the people that will uh, continue to work with a patient and uh, with real cohorts. I don't think that this will disappear completely. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, instead of the virtual... Uh, uh, course and then, then uh, and, make and it all together. Absolutely, and I think so. Is the trust that we need to develop with as scientists? We need to develop that trust with the participants in our studies, the general public. So we encourage them to to keep participating, and then we, you know, we can also use the virtual cohorts, of course, to enhance and develop further our findings, our our work. So that's an important aspect of the trust that I was mentioning before. But also, I think partly the efforts and the, the, the robustness of our work is, is, is critical here. So, so by, by embracing open science and, and sharing code and, and being more open in terms of the work that we do, that, that will uh, enhance that trust, right? So if we are, if we keep our work and our algorithms and our practices hidden and and not being, you know, not being accessible to others, then we are never going to advance in terms of that trust that we need to develop. So that is a way in which science can be verified, results can be checked and double check and triple check. So that is part of the work that we, we really need to make efforts in towards that direction. I can only fully agree, right? So I think we need to be very open also how we generate these synthetic data. So these, these algorithms need to be accessible, right? And we, we need to check and double check by the community really how this is done, how the quality is measured, and also what the implications that are drawn from these data are and how far they are really trustworthy. Also, this might has to be checked and double checked. Yeah? So it has to be open. The code has to be open in essence behind this. Yeah? Thank you. So then maybe what I would like to ask you, what have you, have you already experienced uh, working with uh, virtual courts, something really, let's say, exciting, something that uh, really has, uh, give you the wow moment uh, that uh, you could share if you had to convince someone on uh, start working with virtual courts. So Holger, I think you you will you will say certainly more um, uh, to the point um, or speak to the point. 
uh, I, I want just to make one very simple point, uh, which is, may sound trivial, but, but it's the first step that we do. Um, people are building now uh, infrastructures for collaborative translational research in the clinical context. So uh, you, you may have heard about the medical informatics platform of the Human Brain Project, for instance, or there's the medical um, um, informatics initiative in Germany with, with a lot of collaborative uh, data spaces and stuff like that. And uh, we have recently used um, a virtual synthetic data sets just as a, as a um, for, for a benchmarking of such an infrastructure. This is very simple, you know, it's just data that you can freely float and, and share because there's no, no privacy rights uh, and there's no risk to compromise anybody. Um, and, and that is the very simple approach. Now, Holger has, has scenarios where he is doing much more sophisticated stuff. So Holger, I, I leave it to you to, to go to the- Yeah, real so maybe group. another example, which I was really yeah, surprised of if you <laughs> ask about the wow moment, right? So, I mean, I have been talking to a yeah, quite well-known urologist in Lausanne. Yeah? And I exposed to him this idea indeed of um, synthetic data and uh, what you might be able to do with that, him, uh, this, this data. And he, he was really interested, right? So, and, and he's a physician, right? So, and he said, wow, I mean, this is, this is really cool. And we should do this exactly for these patients like me scenarios that I pointed out. And then in essence, what the result of all of that was, uh, which I see really as a step forward for also for us, is that uh, we will become in essence part of a network of a co computer science network of a data sharing network in which we actually expose to this network, not real data, but actually synthetic data. So the synthetic data is becoming part of a data sharing network. Yeah? So this is, I think, a very first time that anything like that ever happens. Yeah? Yeah, and, and as Holger was saying, um, well, I don't have the results yet, but there are, I think there are ongoing initiatives in relation to COVID, for instance, that, uh, that are very promising in terms of, of uh, synthetic data, virtual cohorts. And my understanding is that there are also important initiatives in, um, in examples in uh, intensive care units. So where the, the numbers are relatively low in terms of, you know, of patients. So um, these, these are, I, th I think these are fantastic examples of where, how to fill in the gaps in, in real data uh, by, by augmenting the data sets. And in, in, in fact, they are already specifically in the imaging field. Uh, there are even already use cases of that where people have used this relatively successfully indeed to enhance prediction performance also of models uh, trained with real data plus synthetic data. Yeah? So indeed, so this, this also demonstrates, so this idea is really, you know, taking pace. Yeah? So it's, it's really something that people more and more jump on. Uh, has any of you uh, discussed it with a patient? What do they think about the virtual cohort? Or to the fact that you can take their data and uh, duplicate it and making avatars? And, uh... I, Elisabeth, I think this is one of the next things ready to do um, because uh, it, it always shows that when, when we as scientists come up with ideas and concepts like virtual cohorts, um, we, we are we are excited about our own idea and the perspectives and now you can do this and that and so on. And uh, the, the most important player in this, in this game is the, is the donors of the data or the, the, so to speak, the instructors, as I call them. Um, and uh, in fact, yeah, we, we, should, we should actually generate um, showcases that are very convincing, that have this aha effect, uh, so the wow effect, yeah, and uh, and then talk to the patient um, uh, representation organizations like Alzheimer Europe or so. Um, I mean, people at Alzheimer Europe are aware of, of this work because we had them in autonomy and in other projects, but uh, the active pushing of this propagation of this idea in the Alzheimer Europe conference, for instance, with a lot of patient uh, rep representatives and, and participation of lay people, 
um, this would be the right stage, I think. I mean, what I really like to add here, um, Elisabetta, is that we don't duplicate any patients, right? So explicitly, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So synthetic patients are synthetic, right? So, and we have guarantees, so we can impose certain mathematical guarantees that they are not real patients. Yeah. <laughs> so this but, is quite but important. Holger, in the in the informed consent, in the informed consent, we would need a clause in the future that patients tick a box and say, yes, I, I agree that my data set is being used to instruct a model, to teach a model, and I don't mind, and, and uh, given the, our state of knowledge and the security measures that you develop and others develop, I, I accept that um, synthetic data sets uh, representing, still containing a good part of the information that was with that particular patient case uh, are being, being shared for the, for the promotion of uh, translational research. Yeah, that this is, yeah. this is, I mean, we have to talk to people like Nicolas Forgo um, to find out what the proper law speech, you know, the, the, the formulation of that clause is, but he will find the right wording, I'm sure. Uh, one, one other thing, by the way, which might be interesting to share at this point, is um, that now even in, in the German federal government has set out a call for synthetic data. Yeah. <laughs> So this idea is, is really spreading, you know? So, it, and in fact, it's not only a thing for medicine. If you think about one step further, uh, we are discussing, of course, your medicine as, as an uh, important application field, but of course, similar types of ideas are in many other fields of, of science or industry, of course, of relevance. Yeah? Yeah. Although we have to, we have to say um, that uh, in industry in FPR, so IMI has this industry part, or the, the IMI projects have this strong industry participation, and it was not so easy to convince people in industry because initially they didn't understand what we were talking about, and uh, they they would solve a lot of problems inside of pharma companies themselves. If 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 the big pharma companies would just virtualize all virtualize all their trials and would uh, open the virtual cohorts up to um, preclinical research, for instance, and, and and their statistical modelers, they would benefit just inside their organ organization, not even sharing outside required. Um, but but you know that comes in the in the next years. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and, and, th and then we are back to the trust question, right? So, I mean, as, as you know, I have been we were working also in pharma, right? So, in essence, yes, on one hand, they see in pharma also the value that might come along with, for example, sharing the control arm of a study across different pharma companies, etc. So, they, they really do see that, right? So, as an appealing idea. Yet, on the other hand, uh, other people sitting there, data privacy officers specifically, are very, very uh, nervous, right? So, and, and think, okay, what if in the worst, 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 worst case, <laughs> we somehow do something illegal here, right? So, and I think this again, then, yeah, it can only be solved by building trust uh, throughout projects, yeah? So, because otherwise, I think it, it will not happen. <laughs> Yes, so I think that I actually have a proposition that could be interesting and so a bit, a bit of a advertising for another uh, thing that we have done in IMI, that is the patient pool, that is a patient, uh, so a pool of patients that are very eager to participate in uh, anything that has to do with the IMI project, but also on research in general, so it could be a good thing that uh, some of you comes and uh, talk to them about virtual patients and we see what is their feedback. But uh, uh, so we will talk about this. One thing that uh, I'd like maybe to ask uh, Graciela, that now she's been a bit quiet. Yeah. Uh, is, um, so I was thinking, what if you have a virtual uh, cohort? Uh, what from a virtual cohort, uh, what could be a benefit that could be say, given back to the people that work with uh, um, real uh, cohorts? And both the modeler, like you, that will continue also working with the real data, but also the clinician that... Uh, so, so, yes, yeah, so that's an important question, but also, you know, think of, uh, from my perspective, for, for instance, right, we have, if you want, we have advances, but we, we still have a, a long way to go in wealthy uh, Western societies. Now, 
think of how people feel or, or how, they, how much more limited the advances are in other contexts. Where, like, for instance, in low and middle income countries. So, for, from, from the, those populations that are desperately in need of advances, that, and that advances that take into account their own cultures, their own context, this possibility of using virtual cohorts to advance research there is absolutely critical. So, in that sense, working with the participants, again, is fundamental. And I think the benefits, if you want, are exponentiated in some contexts much more than they are in other contexts. So um, in, in that sense, I am very hopeful of the advances that we can bring, uh, bring in this, uh, using these techniques. Thank you very much, Graciela. And uh, so we still have no questions, so unfortunately we cannot see our virtual audience, <laughs> so we don't know who they are, maybe they are all uh, completely shocked, or I don't know, we, will, uh, we, will, we don't know. Uh, but um, I would like to ask one last question, to going back to the fact that uh, normally, I mean, of course, uh, uh, to convince people is a trust, but uh, also people have to find it useful. Uh, that um, so of course we said that the patient has of course to become aware if we said that uh, Olga said that the industry that uh, should be maybe a user because they could be very valuable for uh, making a trial faster and cheaper uh, but of course uh, uh, normally what the industry listen to is uh, what uh, the gatekeepers say what the regulators say so has any of you had any discussion on virtual cohorts on the regulators, with the regulators? And uh, do we know, uh, do you have any feedback already? Or this is also another conversation, the need to start. Yeah, I think in general, it's a conversation uh, that at some point should come. <laughs> Um, I mean, I know that there have been cases, uh, very particular cases, though, where the FDA has also accepted uh, a synthetic, partially synthetic control arm in some studies. But I mean, these are very dedicated and special cases then. So maybe where it was unethical to, to run uh, otherwise a real control arm. So I think if you at least um, think about the way that European uh, medical agencies work, um, I guess that there is a long way to go, let's say like that. Yeah, so, so we are, um, somehow we are, we are all, I think we are all aware that regulators are, um, uh, take their time uh, to, to make changes. So some, <laughs> I think we are still in very early stages. Uh, but nonetheless, we have, you know, a bright future ahead. I think it is it's fundamental that we engage with them. Okay, but uh, I think that uh, since we have uh, no question, and um, I would suggest that uh, now we wrap up. And I would like, so uh, first of all, say to everybody that uh, that uh, um, the presentation will be online on the IMI website very soon, possibly already today or uh, at the latest at the beginning of next week. And uh, um, I would like to thank you, all of you, not only for your presentation, but also for clearly the, the fact that you really believe on what you're doing. And I think this is the first thing to make progress in the field. And we hope that uh, we can uh, meet again, maybe having also some patient, some regulator in the room, some industry, and to have a, a more uh, broad uh, discussion with uh, all these important stakeholders. And uh, thank you very much, uh, and uh, have a very wonderful continuation of the day and evening. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, also from my side. And Nice afternoon and nice weekend. And you.
Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.